live from Quito, Ecuador. I'm Sweeney Gray, and this is From the South, the afternoon news, evening news brief from Tell Us Your English. We start this new edition right now. Talks between the Venezuelan government and the opposition are continuing in the Dominican Republic. Delegations from both sides arrived to Thursday to kick off the meeting, which took place all day Friday. They've reported progress since the last round in December, but they won't be commenting further until a deal is reached. The talks are aimed at over overcoming the political and economic conflict in the country. One of the main obstacles that we have had to face during this dialogue process is that some of the sectors of the Venezuelan right wing are playing different games and strategically responding to different interests. So we have come here with the highest of expectations. As we said in the past meeting, the majority of the points in the agreement are already approved, but we have received information from our Venezuelan intelligence services that the violent groups of the opposition are coming back together and planning to attack again. These groups are led by some of the most violent Venezuelan political parties. We are also concerned about the recent statements from these parties like Voluntad Popular and Primera Justicia. They are directing their strategy once again towards violent protests. We saw in the past how they block streets and burn people alive. So as Venezuelan President Maduro just said, we insist on the dialogue. We are here with our highest expectations, with our heart open so we can achieve an agreement to coexist in peace, so the violence in our political landscape can be eliminated once and for all. Thanks a lot. President Nicolas Maduro said he hopes the dialogue will break the political stalemate in Venezuela and pave the way for presidential elections. Maduro asked his delegation to move forward with agreements that will defend the country's economy. He also said his government wants to find a peaceful resolution with the opposition and will respect the agreements made during this new round of talks. Officials from the Nef Netherlands and Venezuela met in Aruba today in a bid to defuse tension over the smuggling of Venezuelan goods into Dutch controlled Caribbean islands. Aruba's economic minister said this meeting will help turn the crisis into new opportunities and they will always cooperate with Venezuela during difficult economic situations. Earlier today, Venezuelan Vice President for the Economy, Wilma Castro Soltero, said that good economic relations are important for both nations. We are happy about the Prime Minister's decision to ban any illegal importation of these materials. There are also other issues that are linked to her decision, and we need to go through them and discuss them. The idea is to find a positive solution for both countries, so we can continue to have the kind of relationships that we had always held with the Netherlands. The busy day for Venezuelan diplomats continues as the ALBA Political Council is taking place in Caracas in preparation for the upcoming CELAC meetings with China and the European Union. Our correspondent, Freddie Gillingham, has this report. So the first ALBA reunion of 2018 is taking place today. Jorge Arriasa, Venezuela's foreign minister, will be joined by Cuba's foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez, at the foreign ministry in Caracas, ALBA, which is formerly known as the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, is an intergovernmental um, integration uh, alliance of Latin American countries and Caribbean nations. The last meeting took place in Havana on December 14th. Um, this is, of course, the anniversary of when the organization was originally set up by the late President Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro of Cuba. Um, during that last meeting in Havana, there was a big emphasis on the um, alliance standing out against the imperialist aggression against Venezuela after a very momentous year where anti-government protests rocked the nation. Um, it was also um, took uh, greater steps in the integration of Latin American nations, most notably Venezuela and the Caribbean nations. The meeting will be finishing at about 4 p.m. today. We will hopefully bring you uh, more updates and findings from that discussion. We thank Freddie for that report. 
It's been eight years since a deadly 7.3 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti, killing more than 230,000 people and displacing close to 1.5 million others. The quake had a catastrophic effect on the island, and even after so many years, Haitians haven't fully recovered from the devastation. Just months after the 2010 earthquake, a cholera epidemic hit Haiti, considered one of the worst in recent history. The cholera spread rapidly, killing thousands, and it, in it infected more than 6% of the population in just over two years. According to the United Nations, 2.5 million Haitians are still in need of humanitarian aid. There are still about 55,000 people living in makeshift camps. The inaugural Caribbean Airlines flight from Trinidad to Cuba lifts off Saturday, January 13th. The announcement was made by Trinidad and Tobago's finance minister, Colm Imbert. According to Imbert, the service will allow people from the CARICOM member states to take advantage of tourism and trade linkages with Cuba. Our correspondent in Havana, Laura Prada, has more details in the next reports. Hello, yes, nice to greet you from Havana. Indeed, tomorrow will arrive the first flight of Caribbean Airlines, the Trinitarian uh, airline. This uh, airline is currently uh, uh, throwing a campaign called Hello Caribbean and Hello Cuba, which highlight, highlights the uniqueness of these uh, destinations. This uh, flight will operate twice weekly on Saturdays and Tuesdays and uh, will allow people from the car surrounding CARICOM countries to uh, have the opportunity to come to Cuba. This uh, route also opens the possibility of uh, tourism and trade with Cuba, uh, said the Trinitarian uh, Finance Minister uh, Colm Imbert. These uh, Boeing jet jets uh, accommodate approximately 160 passengers and uh, will be traveling between Havana and Port of Spain. Tomorrow, at the, when it leaves, it will happen, there will be happening a, a, a goodbye ceremony and also when it arrives to Cuba, there will be a welcoming ceremony. In this flight will arrive to Cuba the Trade and Industry Minister, Paula Guppy, and uh, will be uh, able to uh, see the strong relations between Cuba and Trinidad and Tobago, which are from 45 years ago, when Trinidad and Tobago was war one of the four countries of the Caribbean who established, which, which established relations with, with Cuba the 8th of December of 1972, the so-called CARICOM Cuba Day that we were talking just um, a uh, few months ago when the CARICOM Cuba summit took place in Antigua and Barbuda. This is all I have for now. I get back to you. Thank you, Laura Prada, for that report. We have more news in a minute, so stay with us. Defiant, brave, and mature beyond her 16 years, Ahed Tamimi has become the face of the Palestinian solidarity movement around the world. Journalist, activist, and host of the Empire Files, Abby Martin, went to Palestine to interview Ahed and the Tamimi family. Let's take a look at a clip from that episode now. <laughs> بلاد هاي ومعرضين كلنا إنه نموت بأي لحظة يمكن هسا أنا أشوف جندي جاي يقتلني. Recently, the struggle for Palestinian human rights gained international attention surrounding a new icon of resistance, 16-year-old Ahed Tamimi. 
On December 15, a video of Tamimi slapping an Israeli soldier outside of her home went viral. But what isn't seen on the video is that just moments before, Israeli forces shot her 15-year-old cousin Mohammed point blank in the face with a rubber bullet, causing severe internal bleeding. A few days later, Ahed was violently arrested in the middle of the night in a raid by dozens of soldiers. So you can check out that in Pyre Fire's episode on the Tell Us Your English website. But we're joined by Abby now, live on the show, to take a deeper dive into Ahed's story. Abby, thank you so much for being with us. What a great series of interviews with the Tamimi family. So, thank you so much for having me. Although there's been a lot of international reporting on Ahed's story, there seems to be a lot missing. What context can you give our viewers on her case? Well, of course, every time the mainstream media talks about Palestine-Israel, there's a huge swell of missing context to the situation. Of course, other than the clip that we just saw, where her 15-year-old cousin Mohammed was shot literally moments before this incident uh, that you see on the viral video happened, there's a huge missing context here, right? The biggest question is, why were the soldiers there? Uh, the media is painting it as maybe, you know, similarly to a, a police officer just patrolling around a neighborhood and a kid uh, aggressively attacking them. Well, here's the real situation. This village, Nabi Saleh, I went there. Um, it, it's horrifying. I mean, it is being flanked by huge settlements that are illegal. It is under illegal Israeli military occupation. It is under Israeli military law. Um, under this law, you cannot hold a flag. You cannot be in groups of 10 people. Political organizing is illegal. Political parties are illegal. So we're talking about a family so steadfast in their resistance that they were even fighting the British colonial occupation. This is a family who um, her mom was was almost permanently handicapped from a bullet from Israeli forces. Her father tortured in prison, almost lost his life. Several cousins have been shot and killed. Um, they are trying to ethnically cleanse the village. There are settlers there who are um, armed militia who constantly shoot, harass, throw rocks at these villagers. This is a, a flashpoint of the resistance of Palestinian um, resistance. I mean, this is where the fight is happening. This village is known for their struggle for years and years. They have weekly demonstrations to fight the colonial occupation that is trying to ethnically cleanse um, Palestinians from their from their land. I mean, her, her father Bassam told me that their home has been raided over 200 times. Just think so, about what that life is like for a child. I can imagine, but Abby, you just spoke about it being um, surrounded by illegal settlements. Israel has just approved over a thousand new illegal settlements in the West Bank. Is the two-state solution dead and buried? And if so, how has this fight has changed and what are the hopes and demands for the future? Well, I think when the Oslo Accords happened, there was hope for a two-state solution. And that, and that was really something that, that was a possibility uh, a long time ago. Unfortunately, Israelis and Israel in general, the Israeli government, has not taken that seriously. In fact, no one in Israel really talks about a two-state solution at all. Um, that's mostly something coming from the American side. I think Palestinians living in the West Bank know very clearly that there's no hope for a two-state solution because literally if you just drive around the area, which we did, um, there, there's just littered with illegal settlements and also an apartheid wall that really knifes through this land that would have been the Palestinian state. At the bottom line, there is no land to make a state. Um, there's just pockets of illegal settlements that have taken over, as you said, a thousand more. On top of that, the wall that snakes through the land that just has partitioned families that were together for generations. So there is no possibility for a state. There's no land for a state. We need to listen to what Palestinians say, not Israelis, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what Israelis say. What Palestinians are, are looking for and asking for Americans to help them with is a BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions, so we can pressure the Israeli government simpler, similarly to the South African apartheid state um, because Israelis who are racist are not going to wake up one day and say, hey, we don't want to be colonial occupiers anymore. It needs to come from the outside. And let's focus back on to Ahed or children like her. Any Palestinian child can be detained for 20 years for throwing rocks. And Israel has also just made it easier to enforce the death penalty for acts they deem as terrorism. Every year, hundreds of children are detained by Israeli forces and face physical and psychological abuse. Why do you think Ahed in particular has become the face of the new wave of resistance? 
I think it goes back to that flashpoint of Nabi Sala. I mean, again, she is no stranger to the spotlight. This this little girl has been in two more viral videos. I mean, you know, every week these soldiers are coming and harassing her. So you can imagine how many um, confrontations have, have happened. And of course, two have become viral on video where she was trying to fight soldiers off of her brother and her mother. She's one of 700 children who will be processed in this way through Israeli military courts every year. We're talking about torture, sexual humiliation, abuse, and of course, administrative detention, which could really keep these people six months at a time with no charges. I wanted to mention one thing really quickly, which is she's being charged under Israeli military law, but it's very important to understand the situation under international law, which is you can fight and you can resist illegal occupation. What she did is actually legal under international law. So again, we're talking about an old colonial holdover from British occupying forces that for some reason is still staying true today. But under the international law, she could have shot the soldier and it actually would have been legal. <laughs> That's really interesting. Abby, obviously we could talk to you more about this brilliant interview that you have with Ahed Tamimi, but we can't because we've run out of time. But I'm gonna invite my viewers to go to the Tell us your English website. We have the entire Empire Files interview on our website with that interview with Ahed Tamimi and her family about their experiences in the Gaza. Thank you, Abby, for joining us. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. We go now to Argentina, where workers from the National System of Public Media held a festival to denounce the mass firings of workers from public television, national radio, and the national news agency. More details in the following reports. With slogans like fewer news is censorship and no more public media firings, protesters demanded the reinstatement of 32 laid off workers. We convened an assembly of public media with TV Publica, Radio Nacional and Telam, stopping all activities in all three institutions for the first time in history. We did this to show solidarity and to organize through our union. Si prueba, we declare ourselves under alert and in permanent assembly, using this festival as one way to fight back. Gerardo Masochi, the delegate from Radio Nacional, warned that his institution has greatly reduced its editorial line, as well as domestic and foreign coverage. These measures equate to a disappearance of content. They are silencing one of the most diverse voices available on national radio. In spite of it being government-backed, workers were pushing to have all voices be heard. Laying off workers and diminishing broadcast options, that is censorship. Just like other state-owned media, TV Pública did not evade these cutbacks, persecution and harassment by the government. Their delegate, Agustin Lecuy, denounced that authorities want to start a war on the institution. Last week, a virulent attack started by different media that stand against public workers, demonizing, starting and intimidating us. This past Monday and Tuesday, we had police in our buildings, with patrolmen menacingly overseeing us. These actions undermine the media's functions and aggravates us. With no way of arguing for salary increases for almost two years, public media workers will continue to show their strength in defense of their rights and stand against firings and adjustments within the administration. We now head to Chile where three explosions have gone off in churches around Santiago. Our correspondent, Francisco Castillo, has the latest. This morning, three explosions have been registered in different churches located around the capital, areas known as Peñalolén, Recoleta and Estación Central. The explosions mainly affected the structures, the doors and windows of the buildings. Authorities did find pamphlets with messages that opposed the visit of Pope Francis in the coming days. The messages on these pamphlets also threatened the Pope directly, and some said, Pope Francis, the next explosions will be for you. The pamphlets also demanded the release of the Mapuche political prisoners. Authorities have already started some investigation and the Secretary of the Defense Ministry said that those responsible will be arrested. President Michelle Bachelet also referred to the incident and she said that in a democracy everyone can express their views but in a peaceful way. She also stated that security operations will be increased. Everything is ready ahead of the Pope's visit and the police presence is strong on the streets because there has been another threat of another possible explosion at a church in downtown Santiago.
We thank Francis de Castillo for that report. The countries mediating peace talks between Colombia's government and the ELN guerrillas have asked both sides to resume the negotiations in Ecuador. The guarantor country said that both parties have expressed their will to overcome the difficulties that led the Colombian government to withdraw its negotiating team this week after a three-month bilateral ceasefire ended. They also asked both sides to negotiate a new ceasefire. President Juan Manuel Santos met on Thursday with the four members of the government's negotiating team who returned from Quito. They declared that the government is willing to reach an agreement to end the armed conflict, this despite the suspension of talks with the ELN. After meeting with President Juan Manuel Santos, the chief of the negotiating team, Gustavo Bell, pointed out that the national government has the will to resume the ceasefire and negotiate a new one. He also confirmed that he will stay in Colombia to wait for the visit from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, who will arrive next Saturday. The United Nations has explained that for them to keep the verification scheme, they require to be informed promptly about the decision to resume the ceasefire. This is one of the many topics that President Juan Manuel Santos will address with Antonio Guterres. Gustavo Bell was very clear when he said that for now, the actions of the public forces against the ELN will continue. Words that add to the ones expressed by General Alberto Mejia, commander of the military forces, that stated that the order is to reinforce the military offensive against the insurgent group. We believe that it is a mistake both from the ELN and from the government to intensify the military hostilities. This only pushes away the possibility of an agreement. Therefore, we make a call for common sense and for the dialogue to be the path and not military hostility. The situation is complex. While the tension still remains in the peace dialogue, military actions have intensified from the ELN and from the public forces. The rise of violence will have consequences on the population. The militarization will bring more conflict more victims, more clashes, displaced persons, confinement, and it will mess up the peace environment that was created in the framework of the ceasefire, which was a relief for many regions of Colombia, despite all the circumstances that were presented by both parts in these three months. Among the multiple calls in that of the guarantor countries for the peace process, they requested the parties to begin the fifth cycle of dialogues with urgency to prioritize the negotiation of the ceasefire. The country's regions also joined this call for peace. The call that we make to the ELN and the government from Catatumbo, but also from all the campesino reserve areas that I represent, is to maintain the ceasefire and to continue the dialogue. Complete peace is key. The president of the political party, FARC, Rodrigo Londoño, also sent a message to the parties, saying that despite the difficulties, it's a moral and ethical obligation to continue the search for negotiating solutions. The ball is still in the court of the government and the ELN. In Honduras, opposition supporters are preparing for a large march in Tegucigalpa against political killings and electoral fraud. The opposition alliance restarted their protest on Saturday, where they voiced their anger over the presidential elections, which were marred by fraud and corruption allegations. They will also demand the recognition of Salvador Nasrallah as the rightful winner and reject the violence and human rights violations that began after the results were announced. And for more on the political environment in Honduras, ahead of this march, we go to our correspondent, Gilda Silvestrucci. The opposition alliance against dictatorship has called for a march this Friday at 2 p.m. in the capital. This is part of a series of protests that its leader, José Manuel Zelaya Rosales, and the former presidential candidate, Salvador Nasralla, called for. This will continue the pressure leading up to the general strike on January 20th that will be held for seven days and will end on January 27th with a large event. Besides Tegucigalpa, there are calls for marches in other areas in the south of the country, the Department of Choluteca, where the protesters have been met with repression and military police persecution, according to complaints by human rights organizations. This is what we can tell you on what is going on in Honduras after the elections on November 26. And we'll be back very soon, so stay with us.
U.S. President Donald Trump has denied that he used insulting language about several countries that send migrants to the United States. The reported remarks caused outrage from the United Nations to Central America, the Caribbean, and Africa. It had been reported that Trump asked members of the U.S. Congress, why are we having all these people from shithole countries come here? Referring to Nigeria, El Salvador, and Haiti. He was discussing his move to suspend the temporary protection status and the DACA program. We demand that Donald Trump apologize before the entire African continent, as well as before Haiti, the country whose blood was shed and which lent its minds and bodies to liberate the United States itself from slavery. Him calling them um, African country shit so it's really, really very bad. And I think every African country should just learn from this and probably just stay in their country and work with their resources. The Farabundo Mati National Liberation Front has responded to Trump's words, saying the people of El Salvador are offended. The FMLN said Trump's statement was racist, anti-immigrant, anti-Salvadorian, anti and anti-American. It said this type of behavior was known even during the U.S. presidential campaign and that it will continue to defend with dignity and pride all Salvadorians and especially migrants. Meanwhile, the U.S. ambassador to Panama, John D. Feely, has resigned, saying he can no longer serve under President Trump. In his letter, he said, as a junior foreign service officer, I signed an oath to serve faithfully the president and his administration in an apolitical fashion, even when I might not agree with certain policies. My instructors made it clear that if I believed I could not do that, I would be honor bound to resign. That time has come. Feely says his last day is March 9th. And now let's have a look at some of the other stories making headlines from around the world. U.S. President Donald Trump has decided to continue a waiver on sanctions against Iran, meaning the 2015 nuclear agreement will remain in place, at least for now. On Thursday, senior European Union diplomats had reasserted their commitments to the Iran nuclear deal ahead of the U.S. decision, saying it is vital for international security. Although the Trump administration is expected to set a deadline for the U.S. Congress and its European allies to improve the deal, or the U.S. will abandon it. A massive cholera vaccination campaign is underway in the Zambian capital, Lusaka, to contain an outbreak that has left more than 60 people dead and almost 3,000 affected in recent months. The president of Zambia has called the military to help in dealing with this alarming situation. I think it's going to help a lot of people because, as you can see, uh, a large number of people have turned up to, you know, to get vaccinated against cholera because this is a very deadly disease. Chinese Prime Minister Li Keqiang has signed billion of dollars of worth investment deal with its ally Cambodia during a visit to the Southeast Asian nation. Both the countries signed 19 aid and investment packs for projects including highway and airport development and the launch of Cambodia's first communications satellite. Myanmar's army has admitted for the first time that its soldiers were involved in unlawfully killing Rohingya Muslims in recent violence in Rakhine state. Myanmar has been accused of carrying out ethnic cleansing in Rakhine state. More than 650,000 Rohingya have fled to neighboring Bangladesh since violence erupted six months ago. A group of demonstrators have gathered in the Tunisian capital Tunis to demand the release of hundreds arrested in nationwide anti-government demonstrations. Around 600 people have been arrested during the mobilizations across the country over higher taxes and high prices. Unemployment nationally exceeds 15% and is much higher in some marginalized regions of the interior. Activists campaigning on behalf of detained pro-independence Catalan leaders gave away 20,000 banners reading freedom to FC Barcelona fans ahead of the team's home game against Celta Vigo at the NOU Camp Stadium. And that brings us to the end of this evening's news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, telesyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesyour English, I'm Sunny Gray. Thank you so much for watching.